Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar express, which is Shifting Perceptions of B2B, organized by CIM Northeast. If you're a university student attending today's webinar, you may want to sign up for the CIM Marketing Club newsletter. It'll keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations, and concepts in the marketing industry. All you need to do is to take a photograph of the QR code you see on the screen at the moment, and it will take you straight to the sign up page on the CIM website. So I'd now like to hand you over to Nicola Irving. Head of Strategic Marketing and Communications at Pearson Engineering, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, Nicola. Thanks, Judith. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Really pleased to be here today to share some thoughts and ideas around B2B marketing. Um, it's an area of marketing that I think is often overlooked and sometimes a bit misunderstood too. And during the next 30 minutes or so, uh, I'd like to share a case study with you um, from uh, the company that I work for Pearson Engineering, and I hope it excites any students who uh, perhaps haven't decided which way to take their marketing career um, and encourages them to, to get involved in, in B2B and perhaps uh, bust some of the uh, thoughts that I had about uh, B2B when I was a student. Um, and I hope that for those of you who are more established in your careers and um, or perhaps already part of a B2B environment, that uh, our case study just gives you some uh, thoughts and ideas and uh, figures some thoughts that, that might help you a little bit. Um, I'm sure you've all read the blurb that uh, accompanies this session, or I guess you wouldn't be here, but um, I'm going to set the scene a little bit, just who I am, where I work, just to give you a little bit of a background. And then um, I'll be having a little bit of a focus on uh, Pearson Engineering and what we've learned in the past year or so. Um, it's not going to dwell on, on COVID and, and that sort of thing specifically, much more about, um, about what we've learned about localising our activities when that hasn't been possible and, and what that means for the future as well. So increasingly digital markets, um, more virtual communications, a greater emphasis on environmentalism and not travelling as much um, and, and what we'll carry forward with us. So very briefly, um, a little bit about me just so you know uh, where this is coming from. Um, I graduated from Newcastle University in 2011 with a degree in French and Spanish with German, so not a marketing background at all. But it was during my mandatory year abroad uh, that I really fell for marketing and, and I'm a real marketing nut now. Um, and I was working for an agency in Paris uh, for six months and we were supporting arts venues around the world. And yeah, I really got into it from that point. Since then, I have launched a career in marketing with the support of CIM qualifications. My degree was in a different language, so I, I had to bolster my education really so that I could move into marketing. And I've worked in different areas of, of, uh, of different types of businesses. Um, so I've worked in agencies and I've worked in house, but the largest proportion of my career has been in uh, Pearson Engineering, um, which is in the defense sector. And there are some uh, interesting peculiarities that come with that, um, which have led to some of these thoughts, which, which are hopefully interesting for you today. So just moving on. Um, so this is Pearson Engineering. Uh, we help armed forces to defend, move and survive. We're based in Newcastle upon Tyne. Uh, you know, the, the accent might give that away a little bit. Um, and we've got customers all over the world. So we work um, with friendly forces, I have to say, in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Middle East, India, throughout Asia and Australia too. So it, it's very much a global company. Um, and this is where this issue of how do you localize, how do you be present in those markets when you can't necessarily be physically there. Um, there's only 78 of us in the company. We're, we're a um, business development team of nine and a marketing team of two um, as part of that. Um, so th we, we have some challenges as well as some opportunities as well. Just to give you a little bit more background, see, I know defence is, is an area that's not necessarily familiar to a lot of people. Um, we produce equipment um, that helps armoured vehicles to move really in, in a um, defensive capacity. So um, we provide bridges, uh, a bridge launch mechanism, sorry, like you see in the, the middle image there, to help vehicles to cross uh, rivers. We uh, make excavator arms to, to move equipment um, and to move earth and, and other obstacles, rollers which help to overcome explosives. Um, you might have heard um, when lots of troops were in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, they were facing improvised explosive devices. We work to overcome that. 
um, and ploughs to um, move uh, landmines as well and, and uh, other types of ordnance. Our route to market, and this is the sort of B2B bit, um, our route to market is predominantly through the providers of the armoured vehicles themselves. Um, so they're like BMW or Ford, for example, of the defence world. Um, not those brands specifically, just an example of, of, sort of car manufacturer, but um, specific to defence. Our sales cycle is between three and five years, um, which brings some, some interesting concepts with it as well in, in how we keep people engaged. It's a really complex environment with lots of stakeholders. Um, so we'll be working with the soldiers who use the equipment, um, decision makers within the army, civil servants looking at budgets, um, ministers approving budgets and, and the sort of political angle, um, and embassies as well who give us some support. Typically high value, typically long sales cycle, typically quite complex. So that's just a little bit of background and I'll come back to sort of context of that in a, in a little bit and what that means for us and, and, and where we've had to take some of our um, lessons from and, and apply certain marketing tactics to, uh, to in the last year. But to get us started predominantly with the, the B2B piece, I'd like to invite you to consider um, using B2B marketing means. Um, I've included here a picture of um, the TV show The Office. I'm not sure of the demographic of the audience uh, here today. Um, the Office is a, is a TV show um, where the tagline was where life is stationary. And I had a vision when I was um, quite young and studying languages and, and thinking about translation and that type of thing when I was um, a student. B2B business was really sedentary, really stationary, um, as their tagline goes, um, really transactional and um, very data driven and, and not really much about relationships, not really much about people. It's about moving commodities around. Um, and I, I was really quite wrong. Um, there was a local company to us that dealt with um, gas canisters and I just had this vision of um, working somewhere like that in a B2B environment and in it just being the most boring place on earth. Um, and it, same as engineering, didn't really appeal. Now I think it's really, um, it, it offers so much. And like I said at the beginning, if I can encourage um, anybody who's listening here to perhaps choose a career in that route, then um, I, I'll be happy. Uh, this was kind of what my vision of, of B2B is, and I hope I'll kind of change some uh, ideas, perhaps if you share something similar to that um, as part of this. It's, it's been while I've been a base in engineering um, that I've really learned about um, the power of relationships and, and people. Um, I came into this role still thinking it's B2B, but I, I was really attracted by, um, I'm a motors, motorsports fan and I like cars and, and that type of thing. And the ability to work around um, what are essentially big cars in a sort of international environment with, with purpose as well. You know, there's a sort of um, political peacekeeping kind of angle to it as well. Um, I was really attracted to that and, and was going to put the rest sort of aside. Um, but since I've been here, that's where I've really um, kind of got into the relationship angle. And when your sales cycle is you know, three to five years long, how do you keep conversations alive? How do you maintain your position? How do you keep opportunities moving along a funnel um, without being able to keep people um, on the hook via you know, little tactics? It, it has to be about those relationships. And I think there's some key skills that come with that. Um, and they're undoubtedly skills that I'm sure are shared by other types of businesses as well. I think this is just a mix that really supports this type of relationship marketing. Based up, and you may or may not agree with this, I know it's, a, it's, it's often a contentious issue, um, I believe in the full integration of business development teams with marketing and, um, and sales together. Um, and as I go through these skills that I think are, that they're represented by those four pictures there, and I'll explain them in a minute, I think they have to work really closely together in order to serve customers, to understand relationships, um, and, and to keep everything moving along together, it's it's there's too much information to to not be. So the four skills that I think are, are predominant, and I'm sure other people have different ideas as well. But um, the market the marketer must be an, a, an investigator. They need to understand what's going on in the world, um, know what's likely to impact the stakeholders, um, and to have a really high level and um, tempo of internal communications to keep that moving around. Um, you need to be able to sort of brief different departments and draw on lots of different types of materials, whether it's open source 
or directly from um, those sales team. And I kind of consider it as you're in a relationship with those customers over a long period of time and you need to be involved in what they care about. Um, so that's the kind of investigation angle. I also think you need to be a, a behavioralist, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but with such a longevity of a relationship, um, I think you need to really understand um, the buying behavior, what might move quickly, uh, what might move slowly, um, and what can affect it, you know, world events, certainly in our business, and, and what's going to kind of affect the purchase decision along the way. Um, we don't get quick wins. There's, there's nothing that we can um, do that helps us to keep people on the hook along the way. Um, it, it really has to be about strength of relationship and belief in the brand. Um, we can't do an uh, A-B voucher test, uh, test with a voucher, for example, to um, see what works best and then go down that route. It has to be over a longer period of time and it has to be about um, the, the people and the strength of, the, of those conversations. Um, and that there's an activity in helping the salespeople to, to uh, be involved in those. Must be a strategist. I guess that can apply to lots, but... It's certainly about the long game for us, um, not the quick wins, as I just said. Um, it seems like uh, different constraints can come out of different areas really quickly in, in that sort of environment. So if you are in a, a three to five year sales cycle, a competitor can really easily in that time develop something that can um, dislodge uh, the conversation and move things on. Um, so we have to really plan ahead. We have to understand um, negotiation points, see what might be coming. Um, and then really work to communicate our value when understanding what we're pitched against um, so that we can understand what's often uh, described as sort of hot buttons for, for customers and, and make sure that we can stay with them all the way through, um, despite whatever might be thrown at us. And then finally, I think um, the marketer needs to be a reporter as well. So there's lots of different um, influences that can impact a, a buying decision. Um, in our world, they may, may be um, political, so a political party saying they're going to invest in the armed forces, for example. Um, they might be um, budgetary in terms of you know, COVID has had a big impact recently. Lots of government money being spent on infrastructure rather than um, other things. There's that type of thing. Um, and the importance of a pestle analysis um, is really underlined for us. Um, you know, certainly taking the academic side and then applying it to the business. We do do it and we do it regularly to understand what's happening and then to communicate it around as well. And I think one of the biggest things um, that we've changed recently has been our level of internal communications. I'll come on to that in a little bit in terms of the, the lessons over the last year and what happens to these skills along the way. But it's, it's really kind of reporting what's happening and sharing it so that we can... Um, collectively work towards the same goal, that, that's really been important. And most of that activity, sort of investigating the market, understanding the customers, um, making plans and, and seeing what's happening, has generally been done with extensive travel, localizing activities, things like exhibitions, demos, events, direct sales, um, so lots of people-based account management, that kind of thing. And defense is quite traditional, so being face-to-face -face is has been really, really important. So the, the question we were faced with is, how do you understand the world and communicate it um, when you can't actually be there and you can't talk to people? There's only one headline in the news um, and it's really hard to get information and, and we face communication challenges. You know, our audience and our customers are very um, security sensitive, as you might iman imagine. How do you get in touch with them and make sure that you can both listen and share at the same time um, to really help? The direction of the business. So we first looked, we've got values and value there. The first thing we did um, when we knew that things would need to change was to look within the business first um, and to really understand what our customers cared about and what we cared about. Uh, so what we're good at, what lies at the heart of activities and really what our purpose was. I think it's very easy to get distracted when your, your normal activities um, go in one direction. Um, or, or, or forced in a different direction and to maybe um, panic to adopt certain um, activities to, to reach those people. Um, but we've, we've looked inside ourselves first, reminded ourselves of why we've been successful over the years and then looked to repeat that in some way and, and to bolster it. 
So um, we know that our customers value us for always being there for the end user. You know, it's about the application, not the sale, for example. Um, it's about helping to keep um, soldiers safe. It's about helping them to move to where they need to be to overcome different obstacles. Um, and so we doubled down in those areas, focused on R&D, um, shared educational content, um, looked at ways to, to be there, even if we couldn't physically be there at exhibitions and demos. And that came out in basically adopting all types of communication channels in order to meet the best one for the particular customer because um, they all had different approaches, they all had firewalls within their organisations and that kind of thing. And after looking at our own values and our purpose and, and what we were really here to do and, and making sure we focused on that, the next thing we did was to look at what our value is in the eyes of our customers um, and look on ways to, uh, to build on that as well. So we refreshed our segmentation, understood what the pains, gains and goals were for each persona, how they might have changed over the course of um, the year and uh, what their challenges might be in a different environment. And we looked at how we could be there again in person so that we were um, able to carry on those conversations uh, regardless. And it came down to relationships again. So we enhanced our relationships with our local advisors. We've got a community of people who are sort of like distributors, but they're not, that we have a different sort of arrangement with them, but they represent us in those countries. We really focused on those people. We really um, focused on enhancing their knowledge, helping them to help us making sure they were kept up to date on a weekly basis on changes in their business. That was a real step change in, in how we approached the, the market where they would typically support us rather than being the sort of um, the, the leading entity in, in conversations. And we also refreshed our brand as well, which is quite a big thing to do. And it wasn't done just because of what was going on last year, but it certainly gave us an opportunity to, um, to re-engage and sort of communicate a new way of thinking and a new way of uh, communicating. And that's been really, really positive for us um, in the last couple of months. And then the next thing we did was um, to put ourselves, and this is represented by um, the perspective, the piece there, we put ourselves in the shoes of our customers and considered what their experience was, not ours. And I think I've seen this a couple of times where there's been events um, and a company would perhaps fill their diary with meetings, virtual meetings, and they're feeling like they're at an event because they're busy, they're, they're meeting lots of different people. Um, but actually, if you think about an exhibition, um, a person might walk past the stand that you're on, gather a little bit of information, go in, think about it, come back the next day, find out a little bit more. They may have talked to one of their colleagues or their boss or something like that, and come back for more information and, and dig a bit deeper and dig a bit deeper. Um, and we looked at ways that we could replicate that rather than just filling our own diaries with meetings and, and from a marketing point of view, looking for leads for meetings and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, it was much more about what their experience would have been and trying to replicate that side of things. And finally, just as I mentioned before, um, we enhanced our internal communications with new software, newsletters, forums, just to make sure that we could keep moving around uh, that information and, and to make sure that when things have been more difficult and, and it's been more difficult to get information and to uh, and to share that information that we had ways and means of doing it. So on to my uh, last slide, which um, was hopefully a little bit amusing with a with a llama peeking through a fence. Um, it, it might be a little bit jarring for some of you, so you can't hide behind tech when it's such a, a big area of development in, in marketing, you know, new communication methods, new ways of collecting data, um, which is often talked about, you know, being data focused. And I think the last year has certainly facilitated the shift towards that. But I have a little bit of a fear that it, it can become a little bit of a distraction, um, particularly in a, in a people-oriented business and in where those relationships are, are so important. I mean, don't get me wrong, uh, the team here at Pearson Engineering are, we're looking into the data, we're looking into the numbers, we're looking into the communications uh, methods and, and new ways to reach people but it has to be integrated with the relationship work. And that's that's number one. And I think it, I'll say it always will be, um, who knows what will change, but um, I, I think it always will be. In, in the type of business we work in, it has to be about relationships. Um, and we talk a lot in the defense sector about AI, artificial intelligence, and, and always having a human in the loop. So in a defense context, that's about 
um, making sure that um, weapons aren't firing without a person having made that decision or vehicles aren't going to a certain location without someone having made that decision. In the same way, we're, we're really trying to make sure that we have the human in the loop in, in our decision making um, and you know, putting the, the person and the relationship at the, the heart of our, of our decision making. And you know, there's certain things that are possibly quite specific to us, but we can't use Google Analytics um, for our own security reasons. If we do sentiment analysis, um, it comes back and tells us um, that it's all really terrible because we use and receive words like threat and conflict and that type of thing. And I think that would send us down a, the wrong path if we focused on it too much. We use it to guide us and um, I've got a colleague who does a, a really great job of, of uh, gathering that information and helping us to, to make sense of it. It's something that supports the, uh, the human conversation. And I think most worrisome for me, and the reason that I got onto this topic a little while ago, was um, we did some work with some uh, junior marketers some years ago for a, a local awards, and so many of them, I think it was about three quarters, couldn't see any reason for further training or um, further career development beyond um, search engine marketing. Um, it, it's quick wins, it's, it's there, and you find out what's working, you find out what's, what's not. Um, so then if you're in businesses, B2B environment, where you have um, a five-year sales cycle, how do you interest those people in being involved in the future? Um, and that was something that I left that um, event kind of uh, stewing on a little bit um, and, and hoping that there was an opportunity to, to change. And I think it's really about the, the excitement of being in all people and, and people like people and, and making sure that um, what we do is focused on, on the person at the end of the conversation. So I think my conclusion from um, the last year and, and what had to change for us and what we'll take moving forward is that it's actually about stronger relationships and, and a stronger focus on people rather than a greater focus on, on data or, or virtual means. Um, and this might be very specific to us, um, but we will be investing more time and effort in our overseas partners. Um, we'll be focusing on the relationship with those people and the people who can influence our, um, our opportunities. So the people in embassies, the people in um, Department for um, Defence and Security Exports, that type of thing. Um, we'll be focusing on um, our brand, creating a community. Um, we, we're really lucky to have really great sort of brand advocates within our um, sort of customer base, but we occupy a really historic facility, um, a factory that, that people have a real attachment to. And, and it's up to us to make sure that we sort of cultivate that and keep the conversation going. Um, and it's about internal people as well. I think internal communications has been one of the biggest areas of development for us. Um, and it, it's full circle, really. You know, how do you invest more in people when you can't see them? Well, you, you just have to keep investing in, in that relationship and in people who can help you to do that along the way. It's been a little bit of a, um, a canter through, quite a big topic. Um, very happy to, to take any questions. And, um, or if you want to contact me afterwards separately, then, then please do. Uh, thank you very much. That's great. Um, thanks very much, Nicola, for a really interesting presentation. Um, don't forget, there's still time if you want to download Nicola's presentation slides and the list of additional reading resources from the handout section. And also just a little reminder that if you're enjoying today's webinar and want to post on social media, you can use the hashtag CIM events. So I'm now going to take a, a short Q&A session. There's still time to submit your questions if you would like to, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so first question, Nicola, is um, could you give some examples of how you would replicate the um, customer experience when you're not there in person? Um, it's a good question. We, we had to do things like, um, you know, we, we accepted that we weren't going to have the level of conversation that we would have um, in person. But it was about having lots of different types of content over the course of a week, for example. So there was an event that we were due to go to that was, um, of course, rightly cancelled. Um, and over the course of that week, we um, delivered uh, a white paper. We held a seminar. We um, did a video demo. 
um, and, and multiple types of content that would help people to progress a conversation or a, a progress a line of thought with us. Um, so it was about variety, but within the, the constraints of what we knew that our audience would be interested in. Um, and to underpin that, we had to have a, um, a good mailing list that we knew we could um, return to and that we could use. But yeah, it was just about different types of content in the same way that if somebody came to an exhibition, they might talk to somebody one day, they might you know, explore around one of the products that was on display the next day, they might pick up a brochure and read something. Um, or watch the video that's on the screen and, and just try to replicate that for them over the course of that week. Right, that's a good answer. Um, and then similar thing, I mean, I don't know if you've been involved in any hybrid um, or virt virtual B2B events, but have you got any best practice recommendations, a couple of top tips that you could offer? Oh, uh, yes, we did a hybrid event um, in Abu Dhabi in February. It was a, it was a physical event, um, but we couldn't have any anybody there. Um, so we have partners over there um, and so we sort of strengthened the conversations we were having with them they represented us on site so there was a lot of you know, briefings making sure that they knew about our brand how we like to behave how we like to have conversations understanding what was a good conversation what was um not a bad conversation but um what was a, a, a better qualified lead that's, that's what i mean to say and we set up a um so one tip is good partners, identify them, brief them, make sure they understand the company. Um, the second one I would say would be, um, we had a sort of communications booth back to the UK. So we had two of the business development team were working on um, Abu Dhabi time um, and they, they were available for meetings, which was actually um, quite fruitful. There were a lot of meetings to be had, but the connectivity was, was quite a challenge. Um, so testing that, I think most people would anyway, but testing that um, would be another tip and looking at the protocols of the country that you're working in. So because we were working in the UAE, it had its own set of um, internet protocols, which made uh, some things um, more challenging, something uh, okay to work with. Um, and, and that affected us a little bit. So we had to have on-site AV support the whole show who were kind of there pretty much every day making sure that things worked um, it fell over a couple of times um it, it didn't work 100 percent, but it, it did the job of, of us being there and um having those meetings and, and progressing the conversations but yeah i think av and particular country um challenges or changes or differences that you might not expect are, are useful to consider yeah yeah um next question um touches on creativity how would you push being creative with senior stakeholders who would traditionally want corporate formal marketing is there any room for that in this um this sort of business and different cultures so we've been through a, a recent experience of, of something like that with our um brand refresh which to to many of us marketers is, is a very strategic activity and and a senior management as well but to some people, it is seen purely as a, um, you know, it's a visual exercise or a creative exercise um, in, in how you display something. Um, and I think it's all about, you know, th there's that great Simon Sinek book, Start With Why. Um, it, it's underpinning why you're making those decisions. So it's not creativity for creativity's sake, but rather, yeah. um, what is the challenge? What does my audience need to see? Um, how do I reach it? Um, and if that's underpinned by segmentation and, and your personas, so they have this pain, this is how we can help them, and this could be visualised or, or in this way, just to take a sort of visual route, um, or this event, this sort of different activity that is outside of our traditional um, type of, of marketing, this is how it's going to, to reach it, this is how it's going to meet that need. I would say it, it, it's about that, it's about fundamentally um, underpinning the reason for it. I think it can be a challenge um, when you, you have a more sort of traditional mindset. And I think it's about demonstrating results as always. So maybe um, you know, asking for a, a one-off pass to show something, to prove it, prove the concept, do it at a low level um, with, with minimal investment and show what the results were. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, then another question. Um, in a secretive, confidential 
um, type industry, how do you conduct competitor analysis or is it just down to product performance? Oh, that's such a good question because it is a really, really yeah. challenging area. How do you find out buying? <laughs> um, yeah, um, ears to the ground. So that's kind of travel when we're able to do that, hearing what's going on, reporting back, sharing um, is really useful. Um, you know, there's always um, chatter within a community, even if it's not published uh, online. We do things like like social watching, social listening, um, with a social there, social listening, um, to, to find out what's you know being talked about in different places. Um, and I think just generally watching the trajectory of certain companies. So who's partnering with who? Um, who is uh, working in which countries um, and, and then from that we can kind of build up a picture and I think it's about collecting data together as well not just individual pieces of data or individual pieces of information I don't really give you an idea if you um, we have a um, bi-monthly um, market insight session where the business development team get together and we talk about um, what what we've seen and when you collect that together, you can start building the bigger picture than you know, just sending the odd email here, there and everywhere. So it's about that. But I think it's also um, you have to be obviously aware of you, your competitors and what they're doing. But having a greater focus on your customers and what they need and making sure you're there first with the best solution and, and that kind of thing. Um, so probably a little bit of a balance between um, being really customer and user focused and collecting data would be the sort of succinct way of, of answering, I think. Okay, thank you. And um, then we've got a question. Um, do you use the support of DIT and how helpful is it if so? Because I know they have a big presence in the northeast, don't they, with us being an exporting yeah. region. Do you have much direct contact with them in locally I or do. nationally? Yeah, um, so they are one of our key kind of, um, I'll call them an influencer just because that's what um, you know, sort of in, is understood as those sort of intermediaries that can um, help to, to ease conversations and, and, and help to influence ultimately. But um, yeah, so the Department for International Trade um, in the Northeast, in London, and by extension, the Defence and Security Exports Organisation, who are part of that, um, we, we work with them a lot. It's, it's really important to us to, to keep them briefed on what we're up to. They are connected um, to embassies who are on the ground, who are hearing what's going on, who know the people. Um, and we invest a lot of time and, and energy in, in trying to um, make sure that they're aware of, of our developments, um, our objectives. We have a, a presentation later this month um, virtually to, to make sure that we can share with them uh, you know, what the last year has, has been uh, like for us. But typically we would be in and out of their offices in London, we'd be seeing them at exhibitions, we'd be talking to their counterparts at embassies um, on a weekly, monthly basis. Um, but I would encourage anybody who's looking into an export or global environment to explore um, DIT. Um, they're so well connected, it, it, whether it's connected in terms of um, putting you in touch with somebody or giving you the right advice or finding the right area. Um, they've been really really um useful for us for sure excellent um this is quite a long question the next one but i'll read it all out because so the people might identify with this um i currently work for a b2b organization you spoke about aligning closely with the sales department one of the frustrations we have in marketing is that we're viewed as the sales support department we're measured by ever increasing lead um lead generation targets. As a result, our schedule activities is dominated by repetitive short-term campaigns and longer-term initiatives. Um, so have you got any um, advice on that so that the status of marketing, so that you're not viewed solely as a sales support? Um, yeah, and I think it's about, to my mind, marketing is about listening to the market, reflecting that internally, listening to the business as to how it's changing or how it's going to adapt to what it's learned from that listening activity, and then reflecting it back out again, and it's sort of a circular, um, a circular piece. And I think marketing can often get caught, and I think what's being described here is listening to the business and explaining outwards, um, and, and just sort of sharing in that regard. I think when you can start to kind of round that circle again, and where the marketing department are providing market insights, 
um, and helping to lead the direction of this of um, of where the business development or sales team um, focus their attention. And I'm certainly not saying that we do that exclusively in our team. It's it's very much a, a collective effort. But our marketing team does have a role in looking at what's going on in the world and, and being that reporter and being that investigator, so that the sales team can understand what's happening, can can see what the influences might be, make some decisions and and then it becomes a, a sort of collaborative effort. I think um, having insight into what your campaigns might be. Um, so we have priority campaigns, um, and there's quite a few of them because we, we have product campaigns, country campaigns, thematic campaigns. We share that with the business, with the business and the business development team with their agreement and say, these are the 10 that we're working on. Do you agree that these are your priorities? We can't do absolutely everything. Um, so that you get their buy-in at that level. And then we schedule out what the campaign's going to be um, and they have access to that as well. So they can see kind of um, where the pinch points are. You know, When are we really busy working on this? And this is really important because it reflects back to those priority campaigns. Where can they see that there might be a little bit of um, room for maneuver? You know, We've got a little bit of space. We could do something that helps them to get something sort of de developed. Um, but I think it's about um, yeah, sharing and about being transparent with the, what the priorities are. Um, I understand it. We, we're the same. We get uh, requests for, could, could we do this? I'm, I'm at this event or something like that. And we can do that. Yeah, no problem. We, we'll support it. But there's a bigger sort of strategic um, element to the, to the campaign. Um, and that's what, if everybody's agreed what the priority should be, that's what should take primacy and um, because there's a bigger picture at the end of it so yeah it's kind of collaboration and sharing i would say yeah, excellent and i think we've got time for one more question um which is how do you justify marketing spend slash return on investment for b2b <laughs> yeah um, how do you for your budget <laughs> yeah it, it's um, it's hard because you can't say i did this and here's the result within a short amount of time we have to look at data over a longer period of time so look at how budgets might have changed or, or what we've invested in um, over years rather than um, weeks or months um, return on investment i think is seen um, in terms of quality of relationships um, and i mean we do um, kind of more detailed if i think about you know you do a, a linkedin campaign um, and you, you put a bit of money behind it and then show what you got as a result of it, we would report on that. But we don't typically report on return on investment, for example, like an exhibition um, with, a, with a number. You know, we don't, we don't say um, th this is what we got um, in terms of a sale because we went to this event. And I think it takes the senior management team and the, the directors to, um, to understand that that's, that's a constraint of this, of this industry. Um, you have to put your best foot forward your best people forward and um, invest in what you believe in and then you make damn sure that it that it works at the other side of it and it, it's just about understanding the market i think and, and moving you know seeing far enough ahead that you you invest in the right places and that those conversations eventually become um become a, a transaction for the business but it it is really hard and it depends what your um what your board want to see whether it's I put this much money behind adverts on LinkedIn and this is how many um, sort of leads we got out of it depending on what type of business it is or whether it is about that sort of depth and quality and something more qualitative rather than quantitative I think it depends on the business really um, I wish we could put more numbers to things I, I would love to be able to but um, it, it's really really um, a challenge in particularly in what we do that's brilliant um thanks nicola um we've had some really great questions there from um the viewers so thank you for submitting those so that's all the time we have now for the webinar today i'd like to say thanks to nicola for today's presentation and to cim northeast for organizing the event we do hope you found it interesting and worthwhile our next webinar express where we're going we don't need cookies is on Thursday the 10th of June at 1 p.m. hosted by CIM Southeast. You'll find further details listed on the events page on the CIM website where you'll also be able to register for the session. Thanks again to Nicola for a really good presentation and thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>